Hello and welcome everyone to this game podcast on a most important subject, one that often students find scary. I certainly did when I was a student. Uh, we're going to talk to two wonderful experts on the rich field of quantitative investing. What is it? How to do it? Why it's fun? And what can it mean for you if you want to pursue that as a potential next step in your career? We have Eleanor and Ava joining us for the next hour. They will each introduce themselves, introduce their firm, introduce a bit about what their role is like, and then we'll have a nice fun chat about the day-to-day -day and the long-term and why this is such a great field for women to be in. So why don't we start with Eleanor? Great, yeah, it's really nice to be here with you guys today. Um, and Eva and I have actually been friends for years, so it's really nice to be doing this podcast together. Um, so yeah, as Natasha said, my name's Eleanor, and I'm a quant researcher at a systematic investment management firm called Aspect Capital. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about what that means um, shortly after Eva's introduced herself too. But I've been at Aspect for almost four years now, and I've been working in quant investing for over six years in total. Fantastic. Thank you. Ava, over to you. Great. So like Ellie, very, very, like Eleanor, sorry, uh, very <laughs> happy to be here. Um, so my name is Eva Sanchez Martin. I've been working in quant investment, investing for just over seven years. I work at Man Group and within Man Group, I work at AHL, also a systematic investment firm. I've been here for just over seven years. And within that time, I've been working in portfolio management. Fantastic. So when you step back to your student self and you try to imagine, you know, what, what questions people have about this challenging concept of system, systematic data-driven investing, what, what were you thinking it's going to be and what is it actually? I actually didn't know anything about quantitative investing at all when I was at university. I really hadn't come across it at all. Um, but just as an introduction, in case anyone doesn't know what it is, it's systematic investing or quant investing, as it's called, um, is essentially using computers and algorithms to determine how to invest rather than human decisions. So I think when people think of investing, they tend to think of discretionary investing. So that's when a person reads a lot of information and then makes a decision themselves on what to buy or sell. Um, but with quant investing, we gather a lot of data and then we use mathematical and statistical techniques to build algorithmic trading models. Um, and those models take the data as an input and then use that data to determine how to trade. Um, and we do all our analysis and build all our models using computer programming languages, such as kind of Python and, and MATLAB. Well, you know what, that actually does sound scary. <laughs> so how did it become <laughs> accessible enough for you as a student to seem like a great career opportunity? Maybe I can talk a little bit on this. So um, my background is I study maths at Oxford, uh, same, same as Eleanor. Uh, we actually studied together. And in my time there, I actually came across the OMI, Oxford Man Institute. So I'm currently working for Man Group. We have a great relationship with Oxford. We have this OMI, this Oxford Man Institute. And as part of that, they hosted some events. And I have to admit, the first time I went there, the first time I did a bit of research, I wanted to kind of know what I was talking about, but I wasn't really sure what quant investing was and it did seem a little bit intimidating and I wasn't really kind of sure what the whole thing was I didn't really know what a career path in quant investing really looked like um, but I went there I went to a few different events I met a lot of people and I felt quite inspired it really felt like a career that resonated with me my skills um, and I think some of the jargon and some of the concepts can seem quite scary, but once you break it down, especially if you have like a numerical background, a STEM background, and you're studying either math, physics, computer science, it does feel like the learning curve is quite steep, but actually if you just take it one step at a time, it is all very achievable and it's really not kind of that complex once you break it down. And you know, it, it's definitely a career that everyone can start and kind of build up and, and train as you go along. Yeah, and I actually that's, that's a great answer. Uh, Eva, yeah. sorry, just to highlight something you said that's important is that being numerical is sort of the first step in the direction 
of pursuing uh, quantitative investing as a career path. You could call it almost like a necessary but insufficient condition, right? But if you like numbers and if you like working in a structured environment where there is a systematic approach to how decisions are made, this is a very good step to think about taking. Eleanor, back over to you. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say um, that I actually had a slightly less direct route into it than Eva and kind of picked up the skills maybe a little bit later. Um, so, yeah, I did study maths with Eva and, you know, would consider myself a numerical person, but wasn't necessarily taking the same sort of courses at uni that better prepare you for this sort of role. Um, so I actually started um, as a graduate in an investment bank doing mergers and acquisitions, which is really, really different from what I do today. Um, and as I mentioned before, I didn't know anything really about the world of finance when I was at university but I just through the uni careers fairs kind of heard about the the big banks and their kind of big you know graduate and internship programs so I ended up um getting a summer internship at one of the banks and then I was offered a graduate job in in the same team off the back of that internship um, and it was only when I was there actually that I gradually realized that that particular role wasn't such a good fit for me and I started thinking about what I really wanted in a job and what was important to me in a role and looking into options that I thought might suit me a little bit better um, and I actually heard about quant investing from Eva because by that time she was um, working at Man Group and I thought that the type of work she was doing the kind of quant work sounded really interesting and exciting um, but it was actually difficult for me to move into a quant role straight away because I, I didn't know how to code and um, that was a real blocker for me I'd never done any coding before um, and I also as I said hadn't done any statistics courses at uni really and those are kind of quite important skills to learn and um, so it was a scary decision but I quit the bank and I went to do a master's in financial mathematics to help myself upskill in those areas um, you know the coding and the other kind of relevant mathematical and statistical areas um, and after my master's then yeah um, went uh, went into quant investing um, and I definitely would just say it's never too late to kind of learn these things if you are in STEM, um, uh, you know, you are a numerical person, even if you haven't learned to code yet or, you know, done necessarily the right courses yet, you can absolutely pick it up. There's so much uh, resource and so many online courses available now. And like I say, I didn't get into it straight away, didn't necessarily pick the right things at university straight straight away. But um, yeah, but I'd say it's it's never too late to pick up these these new skills. You're absolutely right. And especially at the entry level, it's not a yes or no decision. Uh, you are exploring career paths in probably the first decade of your career. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind because there are many things that you can learn along the way. Often your friends are your best career coaches, as you just described <laughs> that Eva was. <laughs> and then you can, you can pick up skills along the way. At GAIN, we focus on encouraging and educating young women to try the entry-level investment management career path straight from university. But it certainly doesn't have to be the sole uh, way to build that career. Like you, uh, Eleanor, I also went into investment banking after finishing my undergraduate years because, frankly, I didn't really know what investing was at all. <laughs> and uh, Investment banking programs tend to be really structured around learning applicable tools like Excel, like PowerPoint, like teamwork, like dealing with transactions and, you know, corporate advisory roles like m and are really useful. But what's very compelling is that when you do go into the investment management career track and you're in an organization like MAN or Aspect that has a way of doing things, that becomes very compelling because you can really learn a lot over the years as you progress in the organization. So maybe now you can tell us a little more about the actual firms you work for. What does Aspect do that's sort of different and unique? And MAN, which has been around for many, many years, and has had uh, many other uh, companies uh, acquired into the portfolio to present even a broader array of services. Maybe you can t tell us about these firms and what they do. Do you want to kick us off, Eleanor? Oh, yes, I can do. Um, so Aspect Capital, where I work, um, it's a fully systematic investment manager. 
Um, so we're actually fairly small, a lot smaller than where Eva works um, at MAM, but we have about 140 employees in total. Um, the majority of us are based in London and we are all focused on quant investing. So we don't have any kind of discretionary invest- investors or anything like that. It's all um, all quant investing. Um, and our firm's been around for just over 25 years now. And it actually, that sounds relatively new, but actually the whole quant industry is relatively new compared to some other parts of finance so this is you know not quite as old as Eva's firm but um is you know uh, relatively old in this relatively new space great thank you Eva talk about uh man group a little bit so man group's been around for well over 100 years and man AHL itself has been uh around for over 30 years uh, since since the since the 80s and uh, really just being a quant investment firm in that time. At the beginning, we were better known for momentum, trend following, um, and later on, we really, you know, with some of the OMI, as well as some of the talks we've given on AI and machine learning and so on, we've been known for other things such as technology, um, but, you know, strong 30 plus years in systematic investing and we've got various other arms various other hedge funds under the man umbrella we've got discretionary investment so what kind of eleanor highlighted the aspect doesn't do so we've got another hedge fund to focus on that we've got various other um funds under the man umbrella including most recently private credit so there's quite a lot of uh kind of different areas and i would say um, one of the things I really like about it is you get to talk to a lot of different people. Um, I think it's a really kind of collaborative structure. You get to learn a lot. You get to hear a lot of different opinions. And, you know, not everyone's view of the markets will be the same. So kind of the systematic arm, I think, of things one way. And then you'll have the people trading kind of real assets, having a completely different view. And it's a really nice kind of environment to learn from other people. So you try to provide solutions and advice to different kinds of clients through different kinds of products right Eva that's essentially what you're saying exactly um so maybe if I kind of talk about my role a little bit and how I started so actually about nine years ago now I did an internship at AHL I really really liked the role I liked the work Uh, I then came in um, as a full-time quant researcher within portfolio management and what my role has been from the beginning is effectively aggregating these signals these models that Eleanor was talking about just working on I guess, other models that would aggregate these signals into actual funds that trade. So it's the step from when these signals and these concepts that trade things have been created. So aggregation of those things, portfolio construction, you could call it. Um, And what goes on after these signals are created? How do you put them together? How do you discuss them with clients? How do you pitch them? How do you risk manage them? So that step of, okay, we've got this data and it's telling me to buy, sell this asset class. We've got this signal that works. We believe in it due to whatever research process you have. Now that you've aggregated it, you know, uh, how do you decide how to put capital to it? How do you then pitch it to someone? How do you ensure that it's doing the right thing? So that kind of step after the model has been come up with, that's the team that I sit in, and that's what I've been doing over the last kind of seven plus years. So and you yeah, try to I'm, interpret the results. I'm, so, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, talking about, because Eva does the bit kind of after me, so I was maybe just going to give a co- bit more context right. to that kind of signal generation part that Eva mentioned she kind of takes over yes. after that. And maybe um, define just exactly that, what you mean by the yeah. signal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I'm I'm in kind of a probably a slightly more traditional quant research role, um, which is developing and maintaining our like mathematical models. Um, so these are those kind of investment models that we were talking about. And the work, um, this work we call signal generation. Um, and that basically means taking an idea and turning it into an investment model. Um, so you might start out with some kind of new data set that you've got your hands on and some sort of hypothesis about how that data might be used to predict subsequent moves in the market. And that hypothesis, it might come from an academic research paper that you've read or perhaps something topical you've seen in the news related to the economy that you get some sort of idea from or a conference. It could come. The idea could come from a whole range of sources. Um, And day to day, then what I'll do is I'll be coding up experiments to test my hypothesis. So determining if the relationship between the data and the market moves is as I expected. 
Um, and then I'll be looking at how I can build a practical trading model based on that relationship. Um, and by practical, I mean, I want to take advantage of that relationship I found between the data and the market moves, but I also need to consider things um, such as trading costs um, and things like that. Um, and the ultimate goal is then to build models that make sensible investment decisions um, and hopefully make money. And like I say, that's where Eva's team kind of portfolio management then, you know, looks at all these models. And exactly as Eva says, then obviously you've got to put that into a fund for a client. And it's about, you know, where, how to yeah, allocate to the various different models. So maybe just again, translating this into more everyday language, Eva, I'm sure you can help us with this. A signal could be something like a data point that tells you that the big tech stocks are overvalued and that because yeah, of their sense. large weight in the uh, NASDAQ, that means that NASDAQ might not do as well going forward if they start to sell off. And so there's a signal, there is kind of a conclusion based on historical analysis because of the way that the NASDAQ is um, con constructed or rather reflects the weights of the biggest companies. And then what you wanna do is then take that message into broader portfolio construction to include what other asset classes or strip out certain kinds of stocks. Maybe you can walk us through exactly what it means in terms of applied actions. Good example. And let's, say, let's say Eleanor had created a strategy, a signal that uh, made money in certain macro environments. You might want to you know, maybe another researcher has created another strategy that happens to make money in the environments that Eleanor's signal doesn't. So one strategy could be trading, I don't know, equities or stocks. The other one might be trading bonds and the two asset classes and the two signals are very complementary. And when you combine them, you've actually got a more robust portfolio. And by that, I mean, the portfolio is more likely to make a consistent positive return in that combination. So you're looking at things such as reducing the probability of losing money uh, in a continuous sense. So having, you know, multiple days in a loss or, or having what we call a drawdown. So that's just kind of a, a, a kind of a peak to draw off loss. So kind of mm -hmm. when you start losing money up until the point where you're kind of at the lowest return. So we're trying to minimize that kind of the, the losses in the portfolio effectively by aggregating the signals, or there might be kind of a lot of different things you're trying to achieve. You may have a client come to you and say, you know, this is what I have, this is my portfolio. How would you complement this? And then we look at all the signals that the researchers may have put together that trade various things and look at which are complementary, which are achieving the kind of a solution to their problem effectively. So my role has quite a bit of kind of client client conversations, client engagement, uh, and a lot of conversations just trying to find out what are they trying to achieve and helping them find a solution. So via right. some kind of construction tools and allowing them to access our models via an account. Essentially, what you could say is that quant uh, investing is particularly well suited to customize client solutions, right? Because they can tell you exactly what is their risk appetite and what are their parameters of risk taking and expected returns? And you can construct a portfolio really based on that in a very in a highly customizable fashion. I would say that's definitely a benefit, but not a limitation. I think this kind of even for any other fund, be it you know commingled, not bespoke, there is a lot of kind of benefits in in kind of this type of investment. Right. And so, Eleanor, what does your day-to-day -day work look like, given that you're looking for signals, looking to build them into more complex functions and models? Yeah, day-to-day, -day, um, I think, well, usually you're working on kind of one or two of these longer-term projects. Um, and like I say, we like to start out with quite a well-defined hypothesis that will, um, you know, really kind of have an idea that we really believe in. Um, and then exactly what you're doing may depend on what stage of the project you're in. So in the very early stage, it's about, as I said, really understanding that hypothesis, that idea, maybe reading some papers um, about that to kind of, you know, really understand um, the idea. Um, and then you'll be looking at the data, what data can we get to help us with this idea? And that's a lot of kind of data analysis, working with our data team, um, kind of, you know, getting that data in and seeing what it looks like and, you know, making sure it's suitable for um, what you want to use it for. Um, then next, it will be kind of the hypothesis testing phase, 
which is where you're like, right, we've got this data, which is, you know, a matrix of numbers or a vector of numbers. And we've got, um, you know, our market moves historically, um, which is, again, another matrix of numbers um and how are these two things related is it how we thought you know if one's higher the other one's higher or is it more nuanced than that or is it was our idea just completely wrong um and you're kind of testing the relationship between those two kind of big matrices of numbers that often involves as well as coding obviously because we're testing all of this stuff in code um that involves kind of a little bit of linear algebra often because you are just essentially working with large um, data frames of numbers um, and manipulating those. Um, and then after that, once you've really understood that hypothesis, you'll then be looking at actually building the model. So building something that every day um, will take that new data as it comes in. Obviously, the data is changing every day as it comes in, you know, updating to the new value. It's got, you want something that takes that data and uh, updates uh, how you know, what you think you should be buying and selling based on that. And as I said, you do have to consider not just what the relationship is, but also a lot of practical considerations around kind of what are the trading costs going to be um, and things like that. Um, and, yeah. and what does that look like in terms of your day uh, structure and what kind of tools are you using? And are you by yourself or with a team? You know, what does that flow of work look like? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I think certainly you do have kind of ownership of your own projects. And I've kind of had that since day one, which I've really enjoyed. You really feel straight away, like you, you know, can take responsibility for your projects and really, you know, get stuck in and contribute. Um, but um, it's definitely collaborative. You are not on your own. You are always talking to your team members, learning from your team members. Um, and uh, yeah, and it, you're definitely not on your own. Certainly at the beginning, there's an awful lot of support. Um, and obviously now I do have a little bit more independence, but I'm definitely still talking to my team and collaborating with them all the time. There's lots of people with more experience than me, obviously, in the team who have just yeah, a wealth of experience that I can learn from. Um, and also you find even, you know, newer people come in and they've heard often they've just done a PhD in like a particular technique that could be really helpful. So you're always learning from um, everyone around you and yeah, really kind of collaborative collegiate um, culture. Wonderful. Eva, what about you? So maybe if I kind of talk for my day to day, so slightly dissimilar to Eleanor. So I think my I tend to collaborate with quite a few different teams. So maybe half of the week I'll tend to meet with the risk team. And because it's portfolio management, we run so many portfolios, we look through what the kind of overarching risks are across the firm, across individual types of funds. Um, we look at how they're set up. We kind of uh, have a look at the attribution, you know, what are the current risk drivers? Um, what are kind of stress scenarios? What are things that could happen? How are we positioned? And we look at all of these things in detail um, multiple times a day, but really sit down a few times a week specifically on these funds with the risk team. So that's kind of one thing I look at quite closely every day. Um, I would say a lot of my work is very client focused. So I will have kind of a few different meetings in the week. Sometimes it is with existing clients. So I'll just kind of discuss their portfolio, their return drivers, what's been happening um, in the kind of the models that they run. So really just explaining everything um, in, in quite a bit of detail, getting them to understand that understanding what, what they're trying to achieve from this solution, from this portfolio, sometimes suggesting changes uh, as and when their needs change. So we may have someone you know, originally wanted something to solve X and now they want to solve Y with it. So how can we get from you know, solution X to solution Y? How do we get there? What do we change in the portfolio? And we sometimes run an exercise with them to see how we can achieve their goals and change that. Other times, um, we will be kind of pitching new ideas to new clients. So those are always quite interesting because you get to kind of meet new people, think about how other people are thinking about it. So usually kind of institutional investors, they might have a hedge fund book that they're trying to achieve something with. So it's very interesting. And I feel like in my seat, I get to not only understand the firm very well, but also the industry. So it's very kind of, it's quite nice to see kind of industry, tre industry trends, um, and you get to hear kind of sometimes similar conversations and, you know, learn from all these people, you know, because they're looking at things sometimes very differently to how you are. 
In terms of technically what I do day to day, I would say a lot of my time, like uh, more spent coding. Um, I code in Python. This is something that I kind of knew before I started and have kind of improved and, and continue to pick up as in on the on the job. Um, and I say just over 50% of the time I'm using Python, maybe not necessarily for the same research process that Eleanor is running through, but sometimes to analyze data, to run portfolio optimization exercises, to run analysis, sometimes to write research reports and so on. So still quite technical, but not, not quite the same set of skills or, or tools day to day. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of variety in your work and a good combination of autonomy in your decision making and collaborative kind of work. And again, going back to your student days, what courses or what experiences as a student do you think best prepared you for thriving in this environment? That's a very good question. I would actually say I didn't do that many statistic courses and I wish I kind of did because I did have to learn it afterwards myself. I did kind of choose a few more kind of statistic courses towards the end of my end of my degree and I wish I had done a bit more. Um, but I think just learning MATLAB first and then learning R and then learning Python and just kind of improving my coding was kind of the most useful thing. And I think if anyone's listening to the podcast and you know doesn't necessarily want to go into quantum investing, is not necessarily interested, I would say still take away the fact that learning how to code is an incredibly valuable skill. Uh, I would say in the long term, probably everyone's going to know how to code. I mean, you see children now knowing how to code. And I think that's kind of the main skill that I would say really helped me because coming from a step background, the maths, the, the statistics, you can kind of pick up and some of the other things I kind of picked up by uh, you know, doing some courses, getting some support, some training. Uh, but coding is definitely something that anyone can pick up and not necessarily have you know, a STEM background. Uh, you can have you know, any kind of English history, any other degree, really. I mean, uh, there's kind of, there's no prerequisite to have done a STEM uh, degree to understand how to code. I completely agree with Eva on the coding side. I think when I um, was first thinking about going into a quant career and I was working in the bank, I did not know how to code at all. And the whole thought of it seemed quite scary to me, but I absolutely would encourage anyone to give it a go. I think when I did start learning it, I realized it's really not as bad as it seems. And it's actually, you know, quite intuitive in a lot of ways and quite easy to pick up. But I think there's a real barrier to entry of just people's confidence in doing it. And I really would encourage people to give it a go. I, as I mentioned, went back and did a, went back to university and did a master's where I kind of learned those skills. But there's actually, there's so many online courses available. Um, for coding and kind of resources available online. So I think it really is getting more and more accessible and I really would encourage people to to give that a go. That's certainly been, like Eva said, like really helpful in, in my career and I found it a lot less scary when I actually sat down to, to do it. Um, and in terms of non-coding skills, um, I find, like I said, I have maybe a slightly different role to Eva, but um, linear algebra um, and statistics, I use a lot of that in, in my role. Um, but again, I think anyone, even if you haven't done specific courses in that whilst you're at university, I think anyone who's in kind of a broad STEM degree or is interested in, in this sort of thing can, can definitely pick those things up. I certainly hadn't done any really until my master's in this, on the statistics side anyway. And um, yeah, if you kind of come from a kind of STEM background or are interested in these areas, they are definitely things you can, you can pick up. Fantastic. And who has been helpful to you in your work environment or um, whether it was back at university in terms of career planning or your peer group? How did you think about using those uh, resources to make decisions? Let's start here. So I would say at university, maybe not as much. I did have a few friends that were applying to similar roles. So we did kind of discuss uh, kind of careers and paths, but I would say most of the help was once I started. And sometimes I really just asked for help. So one really good example and something that Eleanor also did, so I'll kind of speak for both of us, is um, 
when I joined, and I guess when she joined, um, just come from pure maths background, some of the financial knowledge was, was lacking. I felt, I really felt myself, I can't speak for her. I had a bit of a knowledge gap in some areas. And um, I took part, I, I did the CFA, I did you know, the three exams. Um, I, I kind of studied for the qualification. And I think at the end of it, I really kind of bridged that knowledge gap. And it really helped me, especially with the maths degree, and kind of achieving some goals I had for myself in terms of learning a bit more about markets and how everything worked. Uh, so I thought that was really helpful. And in other aspects, I'm very fortunate that we have a talent team here. I kind of reached out to them um, about, you know, kind of improving my presentation skills, improving other things. And, you know, I got one-on-one -on -one training uh, for a lot of these things. So kind of uh, training on how to present, um, how to speak more confidently in meetings so all of these things you kind of end up finding out that if you just ask for some support there is probably somewhere you can kind of get help um, and often if something's not set up in the firm that you join for you to you know do something they will find a way to kind of help you with it so uh, I would say that was a really good result you know coming in mm -hmm. thinking oh, mm -hmm. maybe lacking some of this financial knowledge what can I do to fix it um, and they really helped me uh, kind of apply, get the books, uh, get time off for studying and everything. I mean, paid for the course. Uh, so it, it, it was really, I felt like I had a lot of support and also seeing others, you know, maybe doing the second, third exam and, you know, getting their advice. Oh, you know, you need X amount of time. I've done this. Yeah. Focus on studying this. So it really felt like, again, a lot of people in the same boat and, you really saw others had kind of gone through these qualifications um, and it was quite encouraging. I, I found it super useful. Not everyone does, I, I guess, but I personally mm -hmm. found it really helpful. Yeah, well, I think, um, I think, yeah, wherever you are in your kind of career journey, I think having people around who really encourage you to kind of learn and grow, be they your peers, your, your manager, your talent team, I think that's really important. And even sometimes encouraging you to take some, calculated risks like quitting your job and going back to university um, <laughs> I think having those sorts of uh, people around or seeking out those those people those you know opportunities I think is um, is really really worthwhile because I think all of us ultimately just want to continue to learn and continue to grow and make decisions that you know take us forward in a positive way. And presumably given the tech intensive uh, nature of this career path you have to continue learning at a pretty healthy clip and you have to constantly stay ahead of the newest developments and be able to use newest technologies. So how do you do that? Yeah, we actually, alongside our kind of day-to-day -day work, we do spend quite a bit of time, you know, reading papers and going to conferences because exactly as you say, technology is just constantly evolving. I mean, if you even think about machine learning and how much that's come on even in the last couple of years, we want to stay ahead of the curve. We want to stay fully up to date with things. Um, and we have kind of, as well as going out and, you know, reading other people's stuff, you, um, you know, we kind of have cross-team, cross-research team meetings where we share new ideas um, and we're always kind of learning from each other and learning together um, to try and keep up to date. And I think that is one really exciting thing about being in this industry. It is, let's say, relatively new, but it's like evolving all the time um, with technology and with the techniques that are coming up. And it's a lot of thinking about, right, how can we, you know, you might have a new technique and technology that hasn't yet necessarily been applied to finance or applied to quant investing. And you kind of think, right, we've got this new technique. How, uh, how can we use it? Where would it best be useful like is it in the kind of signal generation stage that we've talked about or is it in kind of you know execution like getting the best um you know reducing our trading costs there's all mm -hmm. sorts of places where you can use these new technologies and kind of staying up to date really understanding them and you know thinking about it all together as a team um is yeah is really exciting so is that where you would find uh ways to apply the developing insights and the evolving capabilities of AI and sort of prompting uh, signal delivery and those kinds of things. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of talk at the moment, certainly with all kind of chat GPT and generative AI, there's a lot of talk about how can we best use this? Is it in signal generation? Maybe not. It might actually be more in things kind of like um, helping 
uh, write market commentaries or understanding what your models have done and uh, you know it might more be useful on that side perhaps um, rather than maybe in signal generation or maybe we just um, you know are, are still learning more about it and um, there's like I say different things that different technologies can be useful for but the first step is really you know staying up to date with them and understanding them and then working out you know where and how mm -hmm. they can be best used. So how does your career path evolve? Let's say over the next five to 10 years, what is the career progression uh, in, in quantitative investing starting from where you are, which is already a very significant role and responsibility? Take this one. And, and maybe another thing that I would add is sometimes the career you thought you would have when you first joined a firm or even when you do a degree is not necessarily the one you end up doing. Actually, the, the role I have now and what I do day to day is not a role that existed when I first joined the firm. So sometimes you kind of create your own path and you find you have certain skills and you kind of take on certain projects and you kind of build yourself a niche. Sometimes it's very clear career paths. And I think there's maybe sometimes this misconception that you join a firm, you do the right thing, you move up, then you move up. And, you know, the, the straight way up and it's very obvious, but often there's no kind of clear career path. And for me, I would say in the next five, 10 years, uh, continue to grow my team, continue to kind of uh, grow the number of funds that we have uh, under management. Um, you know, continue to deliver value to clients, go into new new kind of areas of research, uh, deliver new types of solutions. That, that's all kind of quite clear, kind of short to medium term goals. In terms of what my career looks like in 10 years, I may not know what that role exists. And I think that could be said for a lot of different careers, not just necessarily quant investing. You may not know the role that's available to you in 20 years because it may not exist. That's a very good point. You cannot really plan for multi-decade spans, but it does help, especially for university students and recent graduates to think of five and maybe even 10 year increments. I personally found it very helpful to think of my five year plans, possibly because I was born in the Soviet Union and we had five year plans. That's kind of standard uh, operating procedure. But I always thought as an investment banking associate and the later when I joined Capital Group as an analyst, that it was helpful to see people older than me thriving in their jobs and seeing what do they do that inspires me that I wish I could do more of. So let me ask you that question, Eleanor. Like, what do you wish you could do more of? What inspires you for the next chapter of your professional achievements? Yeah, I think my plan is just to keep taking on research projects that interest me and see where it goes. Um, I think it is very difficult. Maybe I should plan better for my next five years. Um, but like I say, the thing for me that I really love is the is the continual learning and um, kind of the creative thinking as well. Like you have to, if you're thinking about model improvements or new models, there's actually quite a lot of kind of innovative and out of the box thinking required in that. And I think I kind of really am hoping to, that's the a part I really love in my job and really hoping to kind of keep pushing that and the industry is always evolving it's very fast moving and so it's difficult to know exactly what kind of themes and ideas will emerge but kind of keeping a really open mind about um, what sorts of projects you can work on and what sorts of things you can you know sorts of techniques and um, things you can you know use and I think is something I really want to continue doing. Great. Eva what about you? Oh, in terms of, I would actually say maybe to go on a little bit of a tangent in terms of the, the kind of people that inspire me, the people that I see kind of 10 years ahead, I've actually taken part on the Pathway Diversity Project um, recently, and it's effectively, uh, they're really trying to get more women to become portfolio managers. And it was honestly so inspiring to have talks with women in the industry you know, when there weren't very many that have become PMs that are maybe kind of 30, 40 years in their career and have been so successful. And I would say it's really kind of inspiring to see women and, and seeing people that look like you kind of achieving these things. So I'd say this course, and it's kind of all throughout the past year, we've had, I think about 30 plus sessions kind of discussing different themes, um, career goals, some training. Uh, it's been kind of really inspiring. And 
I think seeing these people and kind of understanding from them, you know, how they got to where they did and, you know, what steps they took and, you know, some of the training they gave us. Um, yeah, it's really useful, really inspiring. And I would say, yeah, it, having those people to look up to, it may not be that I have their career in 20 years because they may well have changed so much, but I would say that's kind of a really useful kind of benchmark and seeing people that you kind of, uh, are inspired by it is is I would say it's uh, really useful. Yeah, the diversity project is a fantastic organization. It is based on volunteers uh, committing their time and insights, representing very different organizations, and collaborating on work streams. So the many different work streams that uh, they've done very well include flexible working, returners, um, lo lots of questions that are really important to, frankly, both men and women in the investment industry, but have definitely done a lot of advocacy for uh, women to move forward with less friction. And I think of the diversity project as being quite a, kind of a cousin of GAIN. You know, we, we sort of are almost a spinoff because many of us had been involved in a diversity project early on, but wanted to focus on the singular problem of the lack of female applicants for investment management entry-level roles. And to address that, uh, we needed to have role models like you, uh, lots of industry volunteers who do talks and events at universities and schools around the country. And increasingly, we're able to offer summer internships and inside days and pretty comprehensive online training program for sort of fundamentals of investing. So this is very much uh, a, a collaborative approach for us as game, but also we very much admire uh, and are grateful for the work that's done by the diversity project. So when you think about your younger selves and what advice you really wish you had back then about these first, you know, five, seven years of making career choices, let's start by like, what should, what should students be reading? What should people be thinking about uh, prep for interviews or prep for having even like a informal conversation with a mentor from GAIN? What kinds of questions do you wish you had asked? Let's start with Eleanor. Um, I'm just having a think about that. I think um, I actually wish I'd worried a bit less about it <laughs> because I think everyone does. Everyone does kind of find their own path, as we've said. And there's really, it's not, I think I kind of thought, oh, it's the be all and end all my first job. Like I'm going to be in it forever. And, you know, I've got to absolutely do the right thing straight away but actually once you get in you learn it's really hard to understand I think what the day-to-day -day of a job will look like until you're in it you can speak to a lot of people and that is very helpful but I think actually it's not quite the same as being in and doing the job and that I think is the best way to learn what you like and what you don't like so I think certainly when I was like you know talking to um, different potential employers and trying to understand these different roles I think I worried a lot about it and I probably shouldn't have worried quite <laughs> so much so firstly don't worry everyone will find their own path um, and even if you know you get in somewhere like I did and think actually this is not quite right that is completely okay um, in terms of uh, preparing for things like that I think certainly just researching the firm that the person you're, if you're speaking to someone say be it an interview or more informal chat I think researching the company a bit and understanding a bit more about what they do um, is really helpful. Um, and I also think understanding the specifics of the firm, different firms are very different. Um, like even in, for example, with quant research roles, um, in some companies you have a very distinct split between a quant researcher and a quant developer. So, and that's what my company has and works very well for me. Um, and so I really focus on the research side. And then there's a whole team of quant developers that then kind of work on actually kind of putting that into production, those models I build and um, making sure they're okay. But in other companies, that's just all one role. Like you'll do as a quant researcher, you'll actually do that more quant development side as well. Um, and that is obviously more suitable for people who really, really are into the tech side as well, like they're really into the coding side um, as much as the research. So I think that um, things like that, like I think speaking to people, it's, it's really helpful and having a bit of an understanding um, before you speak to anyone, be it in an interview or more informally, having a bit of an understanding of the firm and what they do and being able to kind of ask those questions about how does this firm 
differ from other firms to try and find something that suits you because something different will suit everyone um, and just trying to feel out what those things are. So it sounds like you did a lot of autonomous research in understanding how exactly the firm does what it does and then asking some detailed questions about the role description. Because as you say, in every firm, whether it's quantitative or just active management, you know, whatever kind of management, it's pretty individual to the firm's own process and probably culture. Yeah, exactly. I think it's really important to try and understand as much as you can. But like I say, don't worry about it too much would be my advice, because it is really hard to know until you get in. And there might be some things that you hear people say, and you're like, oh, I really want this, or I really don't want this. And that's good to know about in advance. But other things you'll learn as you get in and learn more about the industry um, from doing. Um, so don't worry too much. But I think, yeah, doing a bit of research and, and trying to ask some questions like that to feel out if it's a good fit for you, the role and the place um, I would recommend. That's great. Eva, what about you? What did you read? What did you do to prepare for asking the right questions and getting the right job? I would say not that much to add from what I did. I think a lot of my prep was just learning Python, learning how to code, but also just understanding what AHL did. So I actually had a look through their website and, you know, they were mentioning things. And sometimes, you know, when you're completely new to this, you might see lots of jargon, lots of words that you just don't understand. And it takes quite a while to kind of put the puzzle together, research what this means. OK, what does this other thing mean? And maybe once you put it all together, you've got a better image of what everybody's talking about. And if you do that, kind of research beforehand it helps it be a bit less overwhelming when everyone's throwing these words around that you've never heard before and I mean it might come down to you understand 10 percent of what they're saying on your first day instead of zero um but it really does help just doing a bit of research trying to understand the really basic concepts and, and just looking through uh, you know as simple as looking through a website you know what do they do okay they're talking about this idea this concept they say they do do research like this what does it mean I'm going to go on and, I don't know, go on SSRN and look at research papers that talk about this concept and just take that on and just, yeah, don't feel overwhelmed because it is a really kind of sharp like learning curve and there's so much to learn and just take it one step at a time. But I guess to Ellen with me, don't over-prepare because it can <laughs> sometimes feel so overwhelming. And, yeah. Excellent. Okay. And so what do you invest in yourselves? Do you actually like investing outside of your day job or is this just something you want to not think about in your non-working hours um I actually don't really do any investment myself firstly there's quite a lot of rules when you're in these sorts of industries about what you can and can't do um so there are rules around that um which makes sense um to have um so there are rules um but also I think for me I think working in the industry it makes me realize even though we spend all of our days doing it every day, we still don't get it right all the time. <laughs> mm. it, it makes me really worry about doing any of my own investments. Um, so I don't do it too much, but I do really love doing it as my job. Excellent. Eva and you? Um, as it, so similarly, we have a lot of restrictions in terms of pre-clearing and uh, anything that we invest in and, uh, has to be kind of go through certain steps uh, for, for the right reasons, of course. Um, I do do a bit, but it takes, it's a lot of research uh, in order to make sure you're kind of doing the right thing. So um, I always think it's best left to the professionals. To be <laughs> what do you think then will be the most surprising thing we learn about quant investing in the next five years? What, what is the thing that makes you most excited about how this field is evolving? Who wants to go first? I think I can try. I think that's just such a hard question. Like even in my relatively short career so far, like we've had various different kind of phases, like we've had kind of big data and alternative data. We've had obviously the big boom in, in uh, AI and machine learning. And we've also had kind of more ESG considerations as well, like people being more concerned with like, you know, the environmental and social impacts of their, what they're, how they're investing rather than just purely making money through whatever means. Um, so I think even in, like I say, my relatively short career, it has what people are interested in has changed 
so much um and I think it is incredibly hard to predict but I am almost certain that there will be something else new added to that list in the next five years or so something else that you know people become concerned about and we start looking into and um and yeah but that's what makes the industry so exciting I think it's it's very fast paced yes and you can use data and you can use those systematic uh, algorithms to customize portfolios to match and reflect the needs of your clients in a way that's that's fairly dynamic and forward looking. Yeah, right. It's great, Eva. What what do you think? Yeah, exactly. I definitely am seeing that. So more ESG, more climate considerations. So kind of moving from kind of un more unconstrained approach to kind of having these guide guidelines just across more and more regions. So we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, and then more data, uh, more data, better data, better tools to process it, better models. So we're learning new things every day. So, you know, um, models that process enormous amounts of data uh, are much more accurate, much faster nowadays. And, you know, previously, three, four, five years ago, um, you would have have been able to kind of incorporate so much alternative data into your model. So this kind of been uh, not just in the availability, but processing has definitely improved. And I would expect that to to mm -hmm. improve. To be a big thing. No, certainly. I guess at some point people are going to start to worry that uh, the machines are going to take over quant investing. So I think, how how do, how do you think about that? I think you still need people to build and manage those machines and you know we always want to have a lot of comfort in understanding in what those machines are doing there's a, a big focus on kind of explainability like even if you are having a, you know building a very complicated kind of machine learning model you do really want to be able to explain and understand what it's doing um, and I think that's uh, still going to be an important feature going forward even as models become more complex. So those communication skills are going to be very important. Definitely. Eva is shaking her, her head. Yeah, <laughs> I'm nodding rather. Agree. Nodding. I think, um, you know, I'm not saying maybe maybe 20 to 30 years, maybe none of us will have a job, but I, I really doubt <laughs> that. I think explainability is, is, is super important and being able to understand and ultimately, and I think Eleanor hopefully agrees but a lot of the time we put these signals these models these things together and the end goal is to have something that's intuitive you don't want to have kind of something that you don't truly understand um actually being the thing that's driving your investments usually you've got a very robust very kind of um well-researched bit of code that tells you how to trade and and the end goal Kind of makes sense it, it should be intuitive you should be able to read everything and understand what happened and you know i think ultimately the people that kind of write these algorithms these signals and then interpret them they will always kind of have a role to play in quantum investing mm -hmm. maybe to a certain extent at some point but i think it, it's a super valuable part of the process it's not just about machines doing everything yeah got it thank you this was being a really stimulating discussion. I think in the context of the podcasts that we have explaining the different aspects and roles in the investment management industry, this may be one of the more complex ones. So I would encourage listeners who have questions to follow up. We have resources on the GAIN portal. There are many resources online about quant investing. I think it's important to keep in mind that there's this kind of a spectrum of capital uh, in terms of how capital gets deployed. There are private uh, funds that deploy capital in private assets that are not listed in the market. There are funds that invest in publicly listed companies in publicly listed bonds. These kinds of funds can be actively managed or passively managed. And the thing about quantum investing is that it basically straddles the whole spectrum because you can do so much with it, that it's, it's not as specialized and narrow in its specialization as many other types of investing. So it's a whole big world out there with excellent advice from Eleanor and Eva about learning the hard skills, learning the coding, learning how to be more numerical uh, and also more communicative around the numbers, which will be extremely helpful in a career path wh wherever it takes you within investment management or, or finance in general. 
So thank you very, very much for your time. It's been a great discussion and I very much hope to see you soon at a GAIN event. And that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.